welcome um, to this pre-performance talk. Uh, my name is Kate Moss. Um, I'm a novelist and a playwright, and as uh, I'm going to have to stop making this joke about being the biographer of uh, Chichester Festival Theatre as we go further from the 50th anniversary. Um, but it is my enormous pleasure, and you know how much I normally gush, um, but I'm going to gush really badly tonight, because I am actually, for the first time, going to be interviewing Jeremy Sands. Um, and I have admired Jeremy's work for ages, but he is basically Renaissance man. You are Renaissance man, you know. <laughs> yes, um, because Jeremy is one of those extraordinary people in theatre that don't come along very often. So he is a composer. He writes the book for plays. Damsel Across the Way, he's written the book for that. He is an adapter, he is a translator, he is a director. Uh, there are not many people that can do all of those things. So I'm going to just start. You know the, you know the rules. We're going to uh, chat a bit amongst ourselves as if you're not there. And then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. But we are, I'm afraid, going to come out at 20 to 7 rather than quarter to because Jeremy has uh, stepped out of the technical rehearsals for Damsel to come and chat to us, and we want Damsel to go on, don't we? Um, so before we start, can I ask who has already seen the rehearsal? Very good. Who's going in later? And do you want me to do the usual joke? Who hasn't got a ticket yet? You don't want me to do that. You at the back, I'll see you later. No, fantastic. Um, Jeremy, you are... Um, one of the great translators and adapters of our time. You know, I, I, I've read the programme, but it is also true. Um, and, you know, you have a, a history with Chichester Festival Theatre, obviously, with national, or in many, all, really, of the leading theatres. What is it about the rehearsal that made you want to do this particular play and direct it um, at, at the moment? You know, was there something particular, personal about it? Actually, it's a funny history, this one. I did it first... <laughs> quite a long time ago, my assistant who worked with me on this show, who's called Rupert Hands, who's a very charming young man, we talked about the history of it, and I discovered that when I first translated this play, he wasn't yet born, which was, <laughs> <laughs> which was increasingly what happens to me, of course. Um, it was done originally for the, um, for the Almeida Theatre and in Islington, and that the new regime took over, a director called Ian McDermid, who plays the Emperor of the Universe in Star Wars, if there are any Star Wars fans. Uh, he directed it. And Jonathan Kent, who's in fact directing here next, who later in the season played, was in it. And they asked me to, to translate it. And it was the first time I'd done any play by Anne Louis as a translator. And it was a real fascinating labour of love because I, I knew a bit of Anne Louis and I knew Ring Round the Moon, which is the one that's, that's best known, I guess. But I hadn't known any of his darker plays, of which this is certainly one. And um, I really got to know it quite well and worked very hard when I first did it. And it's nice to, rem to remember it, actually working on it now, 25 years, God help us later. Um, to remember, actually, I I it's like looking at an old photograph of yourself. You, you don't remember <laughs> how you look, but you remember the surroundings. You remember the... The, the holiday or the bar or whatever it happens to be. The flares. But, yeah, the flares. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Still got those. Um, so that was really interesting. And what was nice about this one, quite randomly, um, I've been that particular translation then went to the West End and then it happened on Broadway a few years later. And then it sort of fell uh, by the wayside because Anui really, he goes in fashions and he, right now or he has been for the last 10 years, if not more, very seriously out of fashion. There's another thing as well, which is, this will amuse you, the, um, the, uh, his plays are very about, you know, about fidelity and wives and mistresses and so on. There was fantastic complications in the Anui estate. He had a wife and several mistresses. And, uh, <laughs> and the legal ramifications, please don't quote me on this, OK? The legal ramifications were quite complicated, and therefore the rights issues were quite complicated. But actually, what happens with Anne Louis is that we associate him, I think, with the English stuff at the time. So I think people's minds, the Anne Louis of Ring Round the Moon, those things, uh, feel like English, like um, pre pre Osborne, pre kitchen mm. sink sort of style. More like Ealing comedies. You can imagine Margaret Rutherford and Richard Wattis. In fact, Ring Round the Moon when it opened on in the West End did indeed have Margaret Rutherford and Richard Wattis <laughs> in it and Paul Schofield. 
And actually, funnily enough, this play, when it was first played in the West End in the late 50s, um, the young girl's part was played by someone called Maggie Smith. <laughs> so this, um, so these, these plays, they do sort of slightly belong to, a, in our terms, to an older theatrical world. However, coming back to it now, and this is interesting, because when I did it, I was 25 or so. <laughs> do the math, actually, I was a bit older than that. Um, <laughs> For some reason, I'm lying about my own age. I know, and so, you know what? We've all got Wikipedia know, now, exactly. so... I, mean, <laughs> um, I was 30-ish. And, but the style of it seemed interesting to me, the, the fact that these people are witty and stylish and uh, linguistically very felicitous and polysyllabic. And what interests me now is the people in this play, as you will, I hope, see, are people who have got problems and in spite of their problems, um, carry on living, and because of the, the panic that's engendered by their problems, become even more loquacious and polysyllabic. In other words, the style is actually a thing that hides pain or misery or emptiness or loneliness. And I used to think style was a fabulous thing in itself. And now I'm older, I can see that actually the metaphor I always think of now is if you think of the walls of a mother of pearl of some fantastic shell with a sort of nacreous, luminescent, iridescent feel to it, that is really protecting some bit of snot and sand <laughs> which, which needs protection. Or a actually, hollowness. Yeah, or hollowness, yeah, exactly right. Center. So this display, this peacock, uh, the Count at one point, I'll tell you the story in a minute, but the Count at one point says, when I'm in love, um, I want to be lovable. Peacocks spread their tails, he says, that seems natural to me. So display as a way of life. Um, I thought this play was about that. It seems to me very clearly that it's display which you do like a shark swims because you have no, no option but to carry on this way. And the play itself, fascinatingly, um, again, this is much clearer to me now, is decadent in that it describes a world that should no longer be in existence. It's a 50... You see it behind you. It's a, it's a world... A rich world. In fact, historically, it's in the 50s. It's set and written contemporaneously in 1950. And it's about a moneyed set of people who shouldn't really be still at it. The wars happened, rationings happened. Um, you can't get staff because everyone's, you know, um, for, any, for all sorts of reasons, mostly social and political. Women are emancipated. Um, there is freedom in France in a different way. And this world shouldn't really exist after the war. And yet these people are still living this wealthy life. Is it, is it uh, similar, do you think, to the sort of, that sense of the world about to change, but it hasn't yet, that you get in Bernard Shaw then? Is it Absolutely. That, yeah, that, that same sort of thing. Fascinatingly, it's about... Because Bernard Shaw's another person who's always stayed in favour here. And, of course, Henri has been very popular in Chichester. And, funnily enough, uh, Shaw was Henri's favourite playwright. And this is... Uh, there is echoes of Wilde, who we also love very much in this. But Shaw, every which way, it is very, very, very... A word I hate, Shavian. <laughs> um, often this, people say, oh, Shaw's so Shavian, they say. Well, <laughs> um, of course he is. Um, but so, can, can I just ask yeah. you, um, b before we move on, about the, the, the translation and the, the you of 25-ish uh, uh, that you were. <laughs> you. Um, have you adapted or modified or changed the translation? Did it feel like a young man's version of the language and you've adapted it now or is it actually the same translation that you did What's, then? Yes, I wasn't a director in those days I didn't direct at all, I was just a writer and musician and funnily enough it has changed and I changed it a lot because of the mouths of the actors we have and the actors who are so remarkable in this, uh, in this show and hand-picked and, and really brilliant and fantastic, what fits their mouths... It's like jazz, you know? What fits their technique sometimes isn't exactly what... In terms I've... of their training, do you mean, their mouths? You know? No, I think I mean their individuality. Right. Um, and actually, sometimes Jamie Glover wanted it, wouldn't you better if I said this, because it suits me, and absolutely. And very often in the big speeches in the play, it's like a slalom. 
They get really complicated. And on purpose, I wrote something with complicated um, secondary clauses and, and parentheses and so on. So very often, a single thought is expressed in a paragraph rather than the, in a sentence. And you have to slalom your way through it. And some actors like to choose a different course on the slalom, as it were. So, so it, it is customized in some ways. It's shorter than it was. Um, I've cut it quite a lot. I think one thing that's changed in the last 25 years is attention span. Certainly mine. For, for, the, <laughs> for the audience, this is a very high-quality audience, I should Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Um, and we have very high-quality remote controls on your high-quality TVs. But, and, but does, it, does yeah. it mean, then, that, I mean, this is so fascinating, that if it, uh, you know, you, you've adapted for, I mean, it is an astonishing cast, um, that actually the play will then breathe out and change and be different again if it were recast or done again. Totally. And so this I, isn't a unique version absolutely, of it. No, it is unique. How and amazing. If I do it again with a different company, which I don't particularly want to, but if I had to, for example, in America, um, if I was forced to take the show to Broadway, um, <laughs> then I think I would change it again. Yeah. Because it's important to me that actors, like musicians, are comfortable um, within, um, within quite firm uh, guidelines freedom as they say is being comfortable in your harness you know mm -hmm. and quite often particularly in this show you, I don't know if you've noticed it there's a big long fourth act which is a big you'll see it has to be as long as it has because of what happens in it but within that it's very carefully directed actually where they stand but, and where they move but within that there's a great deal of freedom right and sometimes even um one of the actors, or two of the actors, sometimes even slightly improvise within that. There are some um, fantastic roles for actors of, bo of both sexes. Is there one particular character, or two or three, that you need to place first, and then you build the company around them? Or are, is it not really an ensemble piece at all? It's completely an ensemble piece. Yeah, it is a concerto for actors, no question. Or, as I think of it, like a climbing frame for gibbons. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so, the, so where do you start, then, with, with casting that? You start that? with a married couple. And the play, for those of you who know it and those of you about to see it, is about a married couple. Um, who don't so much of it... They do it for marriage. It's, it's a partnership as well. It's an arrangement. The French would say a ménage. Yes. A ménage à plusieurs, in this case. <laughs> and, it's, and like Marriage of Figaro, there's a count and a countess at the centre of it. And that's the couple that's central to me. Um, and that relationship is, is, is the key thing, although what we observe in the play is that relationship splitting up. In other words, they have an arrangement that makes their marriage work. And more than that, it's the arrangement that makes society work, their society mm. work. And if you play it by the rules, it all works. But the rules are out of date. Mm. It's, it's, this world is dead and gone. So... Anything that happens, in this case, what happens is love. And the subtitle of the play is Love Punished. And love is punished. Mm -hmm. In fact, love's punished in a few ways. There's a backstory to this play, which you'll recognise if you see it or if you've seen it, which is that in the past, there's been a crime which has been committed. Another love has been punished mm -hmm. 20 years ago. And this love that we see being punished within the show is an echo of that. In a sense, it's a revenge. Um, or as the Count says of the play they're putting on, the Marivaux play, is the elegant anatomy of a crime. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, the description that he makes in the play of the play they're putting on is exactly the same as the play we're seeing. Yeah. Love is, 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 is killed, but actually, by killing love, everyone's killing themselves. Because it's, you, you said right at the beginning that it's a much darker play. And, of course, when it starts, you've got that uh, interesting sort of nested structure of the play within the play, the idea that these are actually 1950s people with a slightly uh, brittle tone and, you know, that sort of archness. But they are in the costumes of Mabiville because they're rehearsing an 18th century play. So how do you decide whether to have them in and out of modern costume or contempt 50s costumes or not? Because you, you keep them don't you? And that must have been quite a big decision. It's actually in the play. Um, it's, it's very precisely written so that the characters stay in costume throughout. It's a rehearsal, hence the title, something I keep on forgetting, it's a rehearsal, it's called the rehearsal, so they're rehearsing. And they're rehearsing in costume. 
And it said quite clearly, Tiger, who's our hero, the Count, hero, our anti-hero possibly, say, says um, we must rehearse in costume, otherwise we won't get used to it. So everyone's in, in 18th century costume. Until the very end when a lawyer, Monsieur Damien, he comes on in a, in a lounge suit and as she says in the stage directions, he's surprising their black in the middle of these 18th century costumes. Suddenly this modern costume comes mm. on. Mm. But the whole thing about what's a play and what isn't. Are we playing in life? Are we not? I mean, you're playing the part of an interviewer right now and I'm playing the part of someone being interviewed. You know, it's not necessarily all of me nor all of you. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of that which goes on this play, which is one reason I wanted to make a set that was in some ways ambiguous. This floor might be a ballroom floor. It might be a stage. Mm. This thing you'll see behind you here might be uh, something they've made for an event. It might be a theatre. It might be the garden. It's slightly ambiguous in that respect. The only concession... that I made a few concessions to the two periods. One's at the very beginning of the show, which you'll see, where I try and make it really clear that we are actually in the 50s as well as in an 18th century setting. Also, a couple of the women's frocks... Um, the women have been asked to appear in 18th century costume. Mm. And of course, they've gone straight to their dressmakers and said, darling, make, yes. me, <laughs> make, make, me, a so make me something modern. In the same way that Angela Julie, Angelina Julie, to go to the Madame de Pompadour ball, would come in in some fabulous Stella McCartney creation mm. with a hint of yes. the 18th century. Mm. So in that respect, the two you'll see the photographs outside if you haven't seen the show. These are two magnificent costumes. Absolute, and both the actresses, Neve Cusack and Catherine Kingsley, both said to me, "They've never worn a better costume yes. ever. <laughs> <laughs> ever. They are absolutely the tailoring is is perfect. Many yes. many fittings, and they are, and they're based actually on some photographs I saw of, of some Debs balls, American Debs balls in of the fifties of the time, coming out balls, you know. But, but it serves a, another purpose: the level of the beauty of the costumes and the the um, the version of you know, the, the period costume that they're wearing, is that it is very expensive and it is very exquisite and it's clear, therefore, that the stakes matter more than one would imagine in a rehearsal being done in a country house for fun, really. Yes. You immediately know this isn't fun, it, quite. Funnily enough, it, it, Tiger, who is uh, the Count, he doesn't work, none of them work. They're all really, really rich. In fact, his wife has more money, much more money than... This is her house, this one. She's got another chateau called Grandlieu, which is somewhere, which is... You know, he says at one point, if only we'd use your other chateau for this, this party. He's got a Renaissance chateau and an 18th century chateau and the Paris townhouse. The money's hers. And this mariage blanc, they call them, this, this, this open marriage... He puts on parties. He's a socialite. He puts on parties. And his reputation and their partnership depends on their parties being perfect mm. and their guests never getting bored. That shallow, I would say. That's the difference. When I was 25 or 29... <laughs> um, I'm going for 34, ladies and okay, gents. I don't know about you now. <laughs> I, thought of that, I thought of all that as being rather fabulous. Mm. I think I'm downgrading my age because it, <laughs> it, it feels so immature now. But it feels shallow now, and what happens is, the Count particularly, you see someone throughout the play, which is rather wonderful, which Jamie does beautifully, a man who becomes baffled by his own life during the course of a play. Everything he's always held to be normal and fabulous and wonderful, everything he does every day, we watch him being absolutely mystified by himself, mm. by his own life. And that's an amazing journey for an actor and from a part. Because he falls in love. And, of course, Jamie Glover is, is well known to Chichester audiences, both as an actor and as a director. director yeah. Do you think, um, and I, I don't think this is a spoiler in any way, but the, the, his friend, and they have been friends for a very long time, played quite astonishing performance by Ed Bennett, um, play, who plays Hero. Does the Count accept his responsibility for ruining his friend's life, do you think? He, do you think it extends his self-knowledge into that? He does accept his... The only reason he accepts what happens in the play, and this is no secret because it's in the public domain, is that um, the Count has told his friends 20 years ago, you mustn't marry this girl, Evangeline, she's called. She's not for you. You mustn't marry her. Don't marry her. So Hero doesn't. And uh, she marries the wrong man, 
dies and Hero drinks and becomes an alcoholic. Or as he says earlier, he said, and therefore he says, I was going to become an alcoholic anyway. My father's an alcoholic. It's a family tradition. Anyway, he, he becomes an alcoholic. And the Count thinks he's done the right thing mm-hmm. until, during the play, we see him fall in love himself. And then he sees... That that the, actually breaks you. Yeah. yeah. He sees. He, he says, I see for the first time I did the wrong thing. Because love, which is an inconvenience and baffling to him, and not what he wants, has happened to him. And he doesn't... He doesn't know what to do about it. It mystifies him. It baffles him. The man who is never baffled is baffled. And it's rather wonderful to watch that. So he also realizes he's done the wrong thing. And he thinks, he says, the scene's great. He says to his friend, I caused your alcoholism. And the friend says, no, I would have been an alcoholic come what may. Mm. She's probably right, actually. It is amazing seeing somebody be drunk so convincingly. Because often, you know, we've all seen a lot of comedy drunks on stage and 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 actually you want to, I mean I felt I wanted to run down and say right you enough you know take the bottle away from him he was so I didn't do that obviously we, we talked about it a lot Ed and I and the one thing the most important thing that that stuff is in your head the alcoholic condition is in your mind it's what is going on there mm. and you take a drink just to calm it down, you know? Yes. And that's so what he does. it's a silencing thing. Absolutely right. right. He, he, doesn't, he drinks to feel normal. Mm. Uh, and he, that, and that, that is amazing. But that there is also one dark scene which we won't talk about in detail for those of you who have not yet seen it. Um, but there is a scene where it could be very ugly indeed. It stops being gentle flirtation and could be something really vile. Um, how did you decide how far to go with that? Because afterwards I thought about it and I thought, do you know it's all implicit threat, actually? N- nothing. Now, is that in the text, in your translation oh, yeah. of the text, or did you rein it back for more modern sensibilities, possibly? Oh, on the contrary. I, I, it, it's a scene that could have been a rape scene and, in fact, becomes something, I think, even uglier than that. In other words he reprograms someone's brain in a horrific way that is unsurvivable. Not that rape is survivable, you understand. Um, But it... it, He is a seduction scene, and it's not done by force. Um, It's done by other means which are equally nefarious and, I think, as as vile, if not more, and if not more damaging. And also to himself as well, because this is a man who uses his own pain to inflict pain on other people. Mm. And the damage is considerable. Yeah, which, which, we yeah. tried to find that... Uh, just a ch- and I said, OK, one rehearsal. I said, let's, let's find the happy ending to this play. Let's imagine that everyone finds happiness somehow. <laughs> we, we really couldn't do it. Um, I hope that people are changed in the play. And I hope audiences are, because I do know one thing for sure. You don't come out of this play like you went in. No question. No, it's always, I think, a sign for any of us um, to feel lucky enough to be in a piece of theatre that when you go out, everybody's talking about the piece of theatre you've seen rather than, is yours red or white? Which you sometimes get in plays that are not so gripping, shall we say. I wonder what the wine sales are like after this show. (laughs) I think the whiskey scores highly. Um, I should tell you, Ed, um, who plays here, drinks a great deal in the show. And afterwards, like any normal person, he wants to go to the pub and have a drink. But, of course, his body can't take any more liquid. <laughs> so he says, have you got anything solid you can give me? It's really... it needs those tablets. Exactly right. Yes, exactly. Really, yeah. um, before we go to questions, I want to make sure people have a chance. Um, you, you've mentioned about the period in which it was written and, and set, you know, the 1950s. And, of course, it was a very different world in France, not just all of the things after the Second World War, but occupation. French women had only got the vote in 1944, you know, quite a long time after us mm-hmm. here in England, all of these things. Is there any um, issue, I suppose, with the uh, psychology of the 50s, trying to make it um, not palatable for now, but negotiating the way that actually attitudes have changed so that the contemporary bit doesn't feel a period piece too. It's interesting. What it is, is a contemporary play. Um, It's a play written in 1950, about 1950. It's a contemporary piece. And I think you can't play a contemporary piece like it's historical. 
Yeah. Whether it's Ratigan or Coward or Shaw, or Mary Wise of Windsor, which is a contemporary play written by Shakespeare. Most Shakespeare plays are historical. Um, many Shaw plays are historical. This one is absolutely mm. contemporary. So I think all you can do is play it as if the characters in it are cutting edge and modern and living real lives. And I think you have to leave it to the audience to say, oh, you know, times were different back then. But to be honest, I'm not entirely sure they are. You know, um, if anything, it's a forward-looking play in terms of its morals. But, but it, is about, it is about love. Mm. It is about love and about how love is a problem. Um, if you haven't, you know, if, if it's not what you expect mm. and you've organised a life that you don't feel those things and it blows your world apart. The artifice protects you. And then when you... I just become, say one yeah. fascinating thing. You talk about Shaw and the world being about to change. I was thinking on the way here, this is the, the third show I've done about a changing world and someone falling in love with the governess. I've done The Sound of Music <laughs> a few times. And I've done The King and I, didn't they, Albert Hall? They are both chirpier, let me tell you. They are chirpier, but they are both about powerful men falling for the person who looks after the children. And, most importantly, Sound of Music, Nazis, King and I, you know, opening up of Siam and post-war uh, rehearsal, they're all about worlds which are on the brink of changing mm. as well. Mm. So... And I think that's when things happen in your life, when things are changing anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a very clever friend who says, change is the thing that should have happened a year and a half ago. <laughs> and actually, if you do a calculation in your head, you think, yes, that's absolutely, of course, exactly a year and a half ago. So change is the thing that should already have happened, I think. And I think you fall in love or end your marriage or start your marriage or whatever it is, not, not the coup de foudre, which the French talk about, but actually, it's happened already, you just haven't noticed it. Yes. And I think yes. that's what this play is about. This, the world was, in spite of their efforts to shore it up, it was rocky and changing. And, and I think that's what change means. Eventually, people stop having the energy to admit that it hasn't happened. The end of a marriage is a, a relationship is a really good example. That doesn't happen overnight. What happens is both partners just haven't got the energy to pretend it's fine. Yes, and it's that journey from heat to cold, really. Absolutely isn't it? right. Yeah. And yes. And a, a final question for me. You've talked about doing it before and doing it again here now. Is it the experience you expected? Have you found new things in it, over and beyond what you've talked about, about your age, being a callow youth and now being a slightly older youth? Um, you know, it, have you found some things in it? just by the act of the direction? So much. So much. Mostly by the other thing that you get with experience is learning just to back off. Back off and let the... And I said this the other day when I was talking in public, which is this one has been like driving a Rolls Royce. This really classy team of actors. Mm. And the adjustments you make are tiny. Mm. But actually... And therefore, for example, I'll give you a good example, uh, Lucille, played by Gabrielle Dempsey, that's a part I never understood really, until I worked with her on it. Because she, because she in, in your younger mind, she was a sort of just a, a stock-in-trade character, she the was governess. The, she was who, the young girl. Yeah, she was just the young girl. But young actually, man, she's not a young girl at all. She's really, she's really smart and experienced and morally vastly superior to most of the people around mm. her. And she's fascinating. She has depth, which I wouldn't have discovered had not even worked with this actor. Likewise, Hero, that part... I knew it was dark, but what does that mean? You know, so to anatomise these things. And we had a long time in rehearsal. We had five weeks. Wonderful. And we worked out the histories of them. We did the timelines. We could tell you when they were married, when the war was, what, what they did in the war, what their parents did. Mm. All of which is in the script, by the way. We didn't have to make very much up. It's all there. Mm. So we really worked very hard on, on histories. So we're hoping that the people who come onto the stage are real people. Yeah with real histories and real problems and real passions and, and it secrets. Is, it you know? is exquisite to watch, and not least of all, the, the beautiful design, the lighting, the sound design. Everything about it feels that it couldn't be other, which is an extraordinary achievement because that doesn't happen that often. The main reason for that is the, act, the, the scene you mentioned, Act 4, it all goes. There's 
a, sing, a bedroom, a single bed and a light bulb, and that's it. So I was very keen to have a, a beautiful world, it really, so I could remove it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing was also to, to, to remove it like this, because here's the rather simple thing about this play, which I didn't realise when I first worked on it. They're putting on a party, and at the end of this horrific season of events in the movie... 200 guests turn up with balloons yeah. saying party. Yeah. So what's actually happening is two things, which is they're preparing a party which is coming to its fruition, just like a putting on a show comes to its fruition. You know, so this, all this, you'll see champagne arriving and, 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 and uh, uh, plants in pots and these dust sheets come down and the whole thing. So as their lives disintegrate, this fairground, as it were, is springing up. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's another reason why I wanted to make it rather beautiful because they're wandering around like zombies at the end in this fabulous thing. Yes, and then they're going to have to decide whether they put those masks back on or not. Absolutely. And, of course, right. for me, we were talking about this earlier, some of you know that I write books set in France, and there was a moment at which Carcassonne was mentioned, although, sadly, it's always mentioned in the sense of the provincial people who can't be trusted to behave properly, I notice. But we won't dwell on that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have got some time for some questions. Uh, so thank you. Lights up a little bit. Anybody like to kick off? Because I'm going to be very strict about getting Jeremy back over the way. Edward, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the division, in the division between translating and adapting. I mean, as a translator, is there a point you can go but no further, otherwise you start to make, turn it into your play? I'm smiling because that question is something I ask myself on a weekly basis. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's a very, very interesting one. And there are often overtones with things like copyright. And right now I've got a French play, um, I've translated a modern French play, and I think it's not working. Uh, and I think there's a way of doing it for an English audience that's quite different from what the authors wrote. And I'm saying to them, right now, I think you should fix, redo your play like this because it'll work much better in the UK and America. And they're saying, if we'd wanted to write it like that, we would have written it like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm saying, that's fine, but just, you know... Um, so these things are, are quite tricky. Um, in this particular case, I treated it like an English script, actually. Um, and uh, I was able... So cutting it was something... Cutting is the main thing, changing it, cutting it. And sometimes when a, 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 if I wanted a laugh or a joke, we rewrote it just slightly... So, but you're right, it's a very, very um, fluid boundary. Between Do you have to go that. back to the estate? I mean, it, it, it. okay, we <laughs> won't ask that one. I was astonished to discover that he'd only died in 1987. Yes, yes. Um, you know, because Ring Around the Moon, I think, was here in 1988. Did anybody see it here? Yes, you see, this is a good, loyal audience. This is Anne-Louis. Yeah, yeah. No, um, there are no problems with the estate. They're, very, they're delighted it's happening. Um, actually, it's interesting, because what estates want mostly is success. So what I sometimes have to say to them, I think, you know, in a long play in France, in France, plays last forever. No one's going anywhere. They're having supper at, at one o'clock in the morning in Paris. They don't care. They haven't got babysitters like we do. Um, so um, cutting um, is something that, that sometimes I have to say to an estate, not this one, uh, this will make it, I hope, better. Having said that, this is not a cut evening. This is a, there, it takes the time it takes. Uh, particularly towards the second half of the play, I found there's no way of... I mean, my attention span, as I said earlier, is really short, but there's no way this play can fast forward. It has to play out like a terrible machine in the way it has to do, so that's right. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Is there another question? I was interested in this question of um, linguistics. You know, the French humour, the French language, the French way of life is so different. And how to, how to adapt that into the English? Yes, how to adapt Frenchness into Englishness. <laughs> in the same way that this play is contemporary, it's also indigenous. So it's a play by, about people in their own world and in their country. So any attempt to make it foreign would be a mistake. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, so it has to be. And that's why it comes out, comes out so English, in a yes. weird way, because it's indigenous. So people are linguistically felicitous. And in the French, is, you know, French is, is not as 
a fertile language as English. In fact, it's a rather incomplete language. Anyone who's tried counting in French, well, well <laughs> 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 you know, it's part of French words that don't exist. Um, so the, the French vocabulary is maybe two thirds, if less, of an English vocabulary. Um, <laughs> so it was nice to be able to add uh, a series of you know, linguistic. Uh, extravagances, and it's a real charivari sometimes, it really does, a lot of words in there um, but that seems to be something that could be thought of as an English thing but actually, my question was how would they speak if they were English mm. and that's, Yes, and that's the only way you can do it, absolutely. you know, it's, it's when you hear translations in English of Chekhov with people going, and you think no, yes. what? You know, it mother, makes no yes. sense yeah. Oh, you silly goose, today's yes. <laughs> Today's my name day, Father. Yes. <laughs> yes it always that. is, I've noticed. Yeah, yeah. And there's a question up there. Um, a question that in your capacity as translator, you mentioned Monsieur Denier was lawyer. I, I think in the play he's described as a solicitor. Ooh, oh. that, is that under the heading? Ten years in France uh, as a lapsed solicitor. Okay. Having tedious conversations. Is he an avocat or is he a... Uh, yes. You may you may well be right. Um, I can't remember if I called him solicitor or a lawyer. I'm sure you're I'm sure you're right. <laughs> I stand corrected, and it'll be, it'll be in tonight. <laughs> you see, the theatre is entertainment. It's education. It's absolutely everything. Is there another question, lady there? Thank you. Fascinatingly, no, he absolutely didn't, didn't give away a trick. And in fact, he banned biographers. So He'd be hard-pressed now, wouldn't he? He would be hard-pressed now, but actually he is. He, I mean, literally destroyed papers, destroyed... He, he, he left not a rack behind, interestingly. So he was very keen that his secrets should remain secrets. And, um, and in fact, it suited him to, to give the idea that... that that there is in all of our lives a, 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 a surface level and a hidden level, and that's how pretty much how he lived this, his life. And the, you know, the, when he died, as I say, various mistresses were found, um, all of whom had been given the rights to the, all the plays at once, and that was uh, hilarious. Um, but he, the plays remain, I think, all of them, about 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 how the outside affects the inside. Um, one of the tropes that you get in many Anoui plays is, is fascinating, and I think massively dated, but very seductive, is the idea that a plain girl, he's very into the idea that there are plain girls. Horrific. You know, that's, that was a bit French, isn't it? Um, a, a homely girl, let's say, put her in a posh frock, and she will become a butterfly from a chrysalis. And it appears in Ming Man the Moon, it appears in Colombe, mm. it appears in Ardelle, it appears in this play. There's Lucille, who you see first off, and it's referred to in her in a plain cotton frock. Push her in an 18th century costume and suddenly her life changes. Mm. Mm. It's, that's an Anouian trope, which is, I think, controversial because it's sort of... But it is all about how the surface can reveal the, what's, been, what's beneath. But, it, but it's also a serious point about how... So long as I, I would say that there are artists of your calibre uh, doing his work, the work speaks for itself, therefore. It cannot be seen through the prism of biography, which a lot of writers, well, all of us, don't necessarily want. You want the work to be the thing. He, he was absolutely insistent on that. He wouldn't do interviews. He's, you know, we just, even his parentage is in doubt. I mean, it's very, very, uh, very shadowy figure. And he only wanted to be represented by his plays. And he presented those very carefully. The, he, the editions they're in are all colour-coded, the pièce rose, pièce grise, pièce noire. Mm. Um, and he carefully chose the editions and even the look of the books with his publishers. So his life was on a shelf like a painter's mm. 
very like a painter. And for those of you, I mean, who who are interested in such thing, the, this program, I know I always say this as if I'm on some sort of weird commission, um, but there there are some very good articles about his life and this production and the various productions of Henri at Chichester in the program. I'm going to do a very naughty thing, which I shouldn't do before I set you three free. Um, How's it going over the way? Well, How's Damsel that. going? Because I don't get to interview you on that no. one, so I thought I'd sneak it's in. It's funny, because normally after I open a show, I sort of have some time off. I've gone right back into Damsel in Distress, which is about posh people living in the castle having affairs. <laughs> <laughs> you started think, for a little typecast, monsieur. It is, it is, it is, well, I'll tell you what it is if you get a chance. It's, it's a caprice. It's something I did a few years ago, not as many years ago as this. Um, it's quite by chance that it's happened at the same time. P.G. Woodhouse and George Gershwin never wrote together. They were great friends, uh, and they wanted to write a show together, a stage show, and they never did. Um, Gershwin died. And what I wanted to do was, what would the show be like if P.G. Woodhouse had worked with George Gershwin? Yes, and you've written the book for this. I've co-written the book and uh, organised the songs and everything. So it's a British... It's a musical about Americans meeting, meeting, England, meeting British people. In other words, um, they like our class... We like their energy. So Americans and English people get together and everyone dances together. It's about musicals and stuff like that. So it's, I think, a delight. And the set is fantastic. There's a real castle next door. It's a real castle. We do that sort of thing quite well oh, down here, you know. <laughs> and it revolves and, oh, it's amazing. I'm just having the absolute time of my life. And having made up this thing with my co writer, to see it on a, you know, what Come I imagine, to life. on yeah. a stage, this castle. Oh, it's just... It's got a... <laughs> hasn't, a hasn't moat got, or a boat. Hasn't, that's got, a, hasn't, got, a, hasn't got a moat or a drawbridge, sadly. Well, it's a shame. It's got a lot yes. of water going spare yeah, over there. Exactly, because yeah. it would nick the um, way upstream yeah, set yeah. and bonk in there. Well, I'm, I must let you go, but as I said when we started, you know... Obviously, you are Renaissance man. Um, I will be back interviewing, I'm sure, another Renaissance man, Rob Ashford, um, on for the pre-performance talk uh, for Damsel on the eighth Monday, the eighth of June. Uh, but for now, we are incredibly grateful that you've come across. You have been a complete delight, and everybody who has not yet seen it, it is a wonderful tribute to Henri, and you have been um, a great um, advocate for how we should watch. The play, and I'm I'm now tempted to go back in and see it again. I must admit. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Jeremy Sands.